The year is 1973. America's first home in space, Skylab, is in orbit. Throughout the three Skylab missions, flight crews conducted a variety of experiments in medicine, Earth observation, engineering, solar physics, and astrophysics. The technology developed during Skylab provided the basis for the design and development of future long-duration space stations. In addition to providing a laboratory for important studies, Skylab marked a significant transition in the spaceflight program. In each Skylab mission, we became workers rather than observers. Skylab also provided a testing ground for techniques and equipment which would be needed for man to work effectively in space. One of the tools tested, the astronaut maneuvering unit, would prove its usefulness on future flights of the space shuttle. February 1984, the 11th mission of the space shuttle program, mission 41B, is in orbit. The astronaut maneuvering unit tested on Skylab is now called the Manned Maneuvering Unit, or MMU. Its first checkout in space is about to begin. Thank you. Oh, this is really beautiful out here. Here, McCandless was 300 feet out from the spacecraft. He had proven the manned maneuvering unit could be flown in space. And he simulated something very important. He traveled the same distance another astronaut would have to travel two months later to get from shuttle to an ailing NASA satellite. On the next shuttle flight, the satellite called Solar Max would be picked up by the shuttle, repaired on orbit in the payload bay, then returned to space. Solar Max was launched from Kennedy Space Center, Florida, on Valentine's Day, 1980, in the year of the solar maximum, the one year out of every 11 that the sun is most active. But within nine months, Solar Max had developed serious problems. The Solar Max repair mission was a very interesting experience from a number of points of view. Uh, for, for some number of years, uh, a team of people at the Goddard Space Flight Center had championed the idea of designing satellites so that they could be repaired on orbit or retrieved and brought back to Earth for repair. It was a chance to demonstrate uh, the kind of things that both the Goddard people who designed the satellite and we who operate the STS had been saying, that is that uh, we can do these things on orbit. Uh, satellites that are designed to be uh, uh, repaired on orbit can save a great deal of money because we don't have to bring them back, we don't have to launch them again. Building things so that they can be fixed is going to become a, a byword of the satellite and space station design of the future. In fact, one of the main reasons for the 41B mission was to test the tools and techniques that would be used to repair Solar Max on the next flight. The plan to uh, capture, repair, and re-release the Solar Maximum spacecraft had been over two years in the making. One of the essential elements of this plan was to use the maneuvering unit and this device mounted on the front known as the T-pad or trunnion pin attachment device to capture an existing hard point on the solar maximum spacecraft and to stabilize it for RMS retrieval and repair. In order to lessen the mission risk to the subsequent mission, 41C, we were assigned the task of conducting an MMU test flight and of proving out the trunnion pin attachment device function on our flight. In addition to the activities with the manned maneuvering unit on STS-41B, we had another important piece of equipment to evaluate for the first time, the manipulator foot restraint. The manipulator foot restraint is analogous to the cherry picker that construction and power line crews use and is basically a foot platform with 
ski boot like bindings that you can lock your, your feet into that mounts on the end of the remote manipulator arm and can be positioned anywhere in the cargo bay area and hold you in a, a firm, stable position without expending propellant as the MNU is required to do uh, for hours at a time. The manipulator foot restraint carried tool boards equipped with tools such as this modified power tool. On the back side, uh, additional simple hand tools. And I exercised this against a mock-up of the electronics unit and some of the other detailed mechanical tasks that were to be performed by Ox Van Hoften and Pinky Nelson on the subsequent STS-41C flight. Challenger Houston at this time, West Star is go for deploy. I do go for deploy. Unfortunately, Flight 41B was also the mission on which the West Star and Palapa communications satellites failed to reach their expected orbits. The deployment of both satellites from Shuttle's payload bay went off without a hitch, but the rocket motor nozzles failed, causing the thrust to be dispersed. Without propulsion, the satellites could not reach transfer orbits. Uh, so we have, we had to explain uh, the difference and what the NASA responsibility was and how the, the part of the mission in, during which we had this failure and the equipment that was represented in that failure uh, was really the responsibility of the communication satellite customers that we were flying. NASA provides the shuttle ride and the customers design, build, and uh, pay for their own satellites and upper stages, somewhat independent of NASA. April 1984, shuttle flight 41C on orbit, having rendezvoused with the Solar Max satellite. Challenger Houston through Hawaii, and we've got a good picture of Pinky flying in the bay. Got that. I'm just doing a little uh, dip in here at that time, Jerry. Roger, copy that, and the ground's giving you a go for the MMU flyover, and the Fox commanding is inhibited until we're on the FSS and tilted. <laughs> Maneuvering unit pilot George Nelson made his way over to the satellite. Commander Robert Crippen, pilot Dick Scobie, and mission specialist Terry Hart monitored his progress and the progress of James Van Hoften waiting in the payload bay. Nelson was having trouble docking with the satellite. The T-pad was not locking onto the trunnion pin, and his attempts were causing the satellite to wobble. His maneuvering unit propellant level was also getting low. He would have to return to the shuttle. Solar Max would have to be grappled instead with the shuttle's robot arm. Nelson headed back in while the crew on board prepared to capture Solar Max. The shuttle was out of range of voice and picture coverage while Bob Crippen maneuvered the ship and Terry Hart tried grappling the satellite with the robot arm. On the ground, mission controllers anxiously awaited word from the crew. Minutes went by before they got the news. The grapple didn't work. Of course, we were very disappointed that we didn't get it. We'd been training for a year, and all of a sudden, it, <laughs> we were missing it. We ended up, uh, after that fourth attempt that we made, and we still missed, and we were getting real low on fuel. That was when the ground told us they thought that they might be able to stabilize it from, uh, from the ground. So we backed away and turned it over to the Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. The main thing that we had a problem with was since it was wobbling, it wasn't pointing the solar rays at the sun. Consequently, the electricity was going down and down and down. Goddard immediately went to an alternate plan for restabilizing Solar Max. A new attitude control program was transmitted up to the satellite's onboard computer. To give as much power as possible to this new stabilizing attempt, Goddard turned off all the heaters, the instruments, and everything else not essential to the stabilizing effort. Solar Max was entering a crucial eclipse on the dark side of the Earth. When Solar Max emerged, its power was almost gone, but it had stabilized considerably. The method worked. The next time controllers checked, the satellite had stabilized even more and moved into a position that exposed the solar panels to the sun for a brief 10 minutes. When the crew awoke from their sleep period, 
Goddard had presented them with a solar max that was ready for capture. Crippen could now move the shuttle toward the satellite for another grapple attempt with the robot arms. 